Hey everyone, welcome to Hurricane Season 2023. Just officially began yesterday on June 1st. Today is Friday, June 2nd, and we already have our first storm. I'm going to spend the first half of this video briefly talking about this. It's not much of a threat to land, but we'll go over it briefly. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about the outlook for the overall season and how much activity we should expect in the Atlantic Ocean this hurricane season. So the satellite loop before you shows Tropical Storm Arlene became a tropical depression yesterday on the first official day of the season, and we can see it spinning nicely out here in the Gulf of Mexico, a bit of a sheared system with convection mostly on the northeast side. This is actually technically the second storm of the year since the National Hurricane Center retroactively labeled a subtropical storm back in mid-January off of New England, and so that took the number one for the season. This would be number two, but it still has the first name, so it starts with A therefore named Arlene. Now, the recon data from the plane that's been in there during the midday today eastern time has found pretty decent winds on the north side. This is about 60 miles per hour at flight level in the orange colors here, and that's about 40 miles per hour at the surface based on what the aircraft is measuring. So that north side getting this up to tropical storm intensity with 40 mile per hour winds and a minimum pressure that's been oscillating between 1001 and 1004 millibars or so. And Arlene is probably at about peak intensity here. It's over warm water, uh, but the shear is going to pick up soon. If we look at where it's situated on water vapor satellite imagery, there's a big trough kind of right over top of where Arlene is sitting. So it's within a nice pocket of light flow aloft, and shear is not prohibitively strong. The system is sheared right now, but not so much that the system is straight up decoupling. That will change, though, as we go forward in time. And one of the reasons is because of the steering direction of the storm. It's actually heading toward the south, uh, which is rather rare in the Gulf of Mexico, especially early in the season. These things are typically moving northeast and moving into Florida if from this location. But instead, this is moving away from Florida. And I'll show you why. This is the European model uh, showing the low-level wind at 850 millibars. There's our lean here in the eastern Gulf. This is a non-tropical area of low pressure near Bermuda. And then there's a, a bit of a ridge here over the uh, central part of the United States. So we kind of have this northeasterly flow coming down into the Gulf of Mexico, and that's kind of helping to push Arlene toward the south due to that steering flow. And as we go forward, we'll see that the, the storm just moves toward the south, toward western Cuba. And so by the time we get out toward the end of the weekend here, it's just down near the western tip of Cuba. And really, it's just going to die there. And I'll, I'll show you why. This is the upper level flow now, looking again at the euro. This is where Arlene is currently situated in this area of white colors, light flow beneath this upper level trough that we outlined on water vapor satellite imagery. So you can see it right underneath, and that's kind of allowed Arlene to get going. Uh, but as it moves southward here, we're going to see this jet streak to the west kind of translate toward the east as this whole trough moves off toward the east. And this is going to result in much higher shear. You see the northwesterlies come strong over the top of the circulation, and this will ultimately kill the system. And you can see this happen verbatim on the model. Uh, if we look at the mid-level moisture plot, the black contours here show where Arlene is centered. You can see the moisture bubble kind of sheared off toward the northeast, but still partially overlapping the center. So we have that tilted system, just like we saw in satellite imagery. We have the center of circulation here, and all the moisture is kind of offset to the northeast, right? So we see that on the euro. And over time, that shear comes in and just kind of moves the moisture right off. The mid-level trough shears off to the east over Florida. And we see the surface circulation left behind embedded in the dry air. So really the only impacts that we're expecting here is, you know, some elevated moisture, potential for thunderstorms, showers over the Florida peninsula. And that's about it. Amazingly, no significant impacts from a storm forming in the Gulf of Mexico. Quite a rarity, uh, and we're lucky that that's true, and hopefully folks who need some rain will get some rain here. If we look at the NHC forecast, you can see the same kind of message here. Dissipation shown by Saturday evening off the northwest tip of Cuba, and again, just some rain out over the water and then some over the Florida Peninsula as well, but not much to be concerned about unless there's an isolated area that gets several inches fast, and then you might see some flash flood warnings. That could happen any day in Florida, so not a whole lot to see here, thankfully. All right, so let's talk about briefly the outlook for the overall hurricane season since we're getting started here, and this is the current map of sea surface temperature anomalies 
Uh, red colors mean warmer than normal, blue colors mean colder than normal in terms of the surface ocean temperature. And one of the big changes we're seeing from the last couple of years is that we're getting an El Nino to replace the La Nina that we've had for a little while. So we see this warm tongue out over the equatorial Pacific, and this is now developing a pace and could in fact become a moderate to strong El Nino based on some projections. Never quite sure how strong the El Nino will be before it actually happens, but within a couple months we'll have a good idea of how strong this event will actually be. Now the hallmark of El Nino events is that they typically suppress the Atlantic hurricane season and cause fewer storms, more hostile conditions for the storms that do form. And that's because uh, the warm water here generates a lot of extra thunderstorm activity that then pulls a lot of air in the lower levels from the east on the eastern side, which causes stronger trade winds through the Caribbean. It also causes more upper level outflow from the opposite direction from the west aloft. So those two together cause a lot of enhanced vertical shear over the tropical Atlantic, typically suppresses conditions for hurricane formation. And it also typically focuses a lot of the thunderstorm activity naturally over the equatorial Pacific and the eastern Pacific has a big hurricane season. The central Pacific and Hawaii can have big hurricane seasons and the Atlantic often has sinking air in response to all the rising air on the other side of the Americas. Uh, so typically El Nino really brings the hurricane season down. However, there are some competing factors that could still keep the Atlantic in a fighting stance, and that's all this warm water that we see in the tropics. And uh, this is not always the case when we have an El Nino, and uh, we've had a cooler MDR in some previous years here, but it is warm right now, and it's actually forecast to continue getting warmer during the course of the season. And uh, one of the big signs that that might happen is all this in the Northeast uh, Atlantic off of Africa and Portugal, uh, the warmer than normal canary current, which is the cold current of water that comes down uh, the eastern side of the Atlantic Basin, that's all warmer than normal right now. If that persists, that typically means a warmer MDR, main development region, during the bulk of the season, and less stable air. Typically, the trade winds bring cool, stable air down into the area where tropical waves are coming off Africa and trying to develop. If this water is warmer, that mutes the effect and makes that air a little less stable than it usually is, which is uh, usually a more favorable state for tropical waves to try to develop in as they march toward the west from Africa toward the Caribbean and the Western Atlantic. So let's look at the forecast from the North American model ensemble, multi-model ensemble. This is for July, August, September. So during kind of the middle of the hurricane season here, showing the big, strong El Nino developing. And you can see that uh, the models agree in general that there's this big banana-shaped area of warm water in the North Atlantic. That's a classic hallmark of an active Atlantic hurricane season when you have a belt of water like that. And even some of the uh, non-American models like the European seasonal forecast and the UK Met seasonal forecast also have this belt of warm water here. Now I told you before that normally when we have an El Nino we have very strong trade winds coming out of the east across Central America. Well strangely a lot of these models actually show weaker than normal trade winds over the Atlantic and have westerly anomalies instead. That would again be a sign of a more active hurricane season in the Atlantic, not less. But can this really happen? Uh, it's not common that we get such a strong fight between the Atlantic signal and the El Nino signal in the Pacific. Uh, there are a couple of reasons to, to think that maybe the models are onto something and maybe we don't have a fully suppressed hurricane season. One of them is that we have a, a negative PMM, a Pacific Meridiana mode here. We have a cold tongue of water forecast to persist between Hawaii and the Baja Peninsula. And this does put a dent in the total area of water in the eastern Pacific that is warm enough to support free convection. And if we shrink that overall area of warm water, perhaps there's a little bit less convection overall in the eastern Pacific to fight with the Atlantic for ascending motion. So perhaps there's a little more thunderstorm activity in the Atlantic overall with the water this warm and the Pacific warm water kind of confined near the equator here. Now, I did take a look at uh, some previous years to see, you know, when in history, since 1950, when we have reliable ocean data, did we have a El Nino, uh, a moderate to strong El Nino, and also a warm Atlantic main development region. It's not as common as you might think, uh, but one of the analogs I found, really the only one that kind of makes sense compared to 2023, is 1951. And this is the composite ERSST 
uh, from that July through August period in 1951. And you can, of course, see the El Nino here. And you can also see the negative PMM right here, the cold water between Hawaii and, and California. And uh, the Atlantic might not look that warm, but keep in mind this is 1951 with a climatology period of 1981 to 2010. So really this belt here, if you detrend the whole uh, time series, is at about plus 0.3 degrees Celsius in the MDR box here. So I, I did this out to 85 west, that box is plus 0.3 degrees Celsius uh, when you detrend it. So it's actually a fairly warm MDR in this particular year relative to the rest of the globe. And we had a moderate El Nino, the ONI index got up to 1.2 when we got to the end of summer and the beginning of fall during this particular El Nino event and we have the negative PMM. So pretty similar to this year. It's the only one I could really find that's actually that similar. So what actually happened? Uh, if we look at the 850 millibar zonal wind anomaly from the era five reanalysis for that year, uh, warm, warm colors here mean westerly anomalies. So we see the El Nino uh, equatorial Pacific westerlies, which we expect. And uh, in the Atlantic though, Interestingly enough, normally you'd have a ton of green here, you know, strong trade winds ripping through the Caribbean, moving out into the Eastern Pacific. It's actually not that crazy. We even have a little tongue of yellow here indicating westerly anomalies and then easterly anomalies to the north. So over the Caribbean, we actually had an axis of cyclonic anomaly in the deep tropics. And we actually had a couple hurricanes cruise through there during the season. And this is not dissimilar from some of the signaling we're seeing in the seasonal models, which show maybe not necessarily screaming trade winds through the Caribbean during the height of hurricane season, despite the El Nino. And 1951 here seems to be an example of how that has happened before, where we haven't had crazy strong trades. This is how the hurricane season turned out from the, the graphic that is provided on, on Wikipedia. And you can see we actually had a couple of Caribbean cruisers, interestingly enough, one of them was a major that hit the Yucatan Peninsula. And we had a lot of activity out in the Southwest Atlantic. And you can see that the Cape uh, Verde season, Cabo Verde season was fairly active, several storms coming out of the main development region and uh, moving northward. Uh, both west and east of Bermuda. And this was overall a slightly above average hurricane season, 12 storms, which is normal, but uh, seven of them or eight of them became hurricanes, three of them major hurricanes, which is slightly above normal. And the ACE index accumulated cyclone energy was 126. So that's about 25, 20 to 25% above normal. So this was actually a, a normal to above average hurricane season, despite the moderate strength El Nino that existed in that year. So that could be just a possible example of why this hurricane season uh, might not be fully suppressed like we typically expect during an El Nino, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. Lots of things can happen. There's no guarantee this will be like 1951. And accordingly, the National Hurricane Center, or rather uh, I should say NOAA, the Climate Prediction Center's hurricane forecast for the season uh, is kind of uncertain. Uh, highest probability here is for near normal at 40%, but 30% chance of an above normal season and 30% chance for a below normal. So that's about as neutral of a forecast as they could give. The probabilities are symmetric around normal. So they're essentially forecasting a neutral year, uh, but we can never be super sure. Uh, seasonal forecasting is not an exact science and we could either we could see anything uh, this particular year. So we'll watch and see what happens. The important thing is that overall activity during the hurricane season does not correspond very well with the number of hurricane strikes on land areas. So you should always be prepared to take the beginning of this hurricane season as a reminder to have a plan in place just in case a storm forms up and comes your way. It can happen in a matter of a couple days. You don't always have a week's worth of warning and sometimes they happen right on top of you. So have a plan ready to go, be prepared, and be ready to spring into action just in case during the 2023 hurricane season. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.